Hello and welcome to the module on Bayesian Machine Learning. In this module, we are going to learn about probability theory and how it can be used in conjunction with machine learning to, be, to provide interpretable and expressible artificial intelligence. Bayesian Machine Learning is a form of symbolic learning where we learn how to transform probability distributions known on, the, on some of the input variables uh, into what we are trying to measure as the output variable and learn some parameters on the way. We are going to see examples of this in the future labs, but in the first lab, we are just going to try to visualize a few probability distributions using uh, the plotting tools that we have in Python, and we are going to uh, try to understand Bayes' rule with a example. So first, um, let's start off by taking a look at the Gaussian probability distribution. Uh, this piece of code um, sets up the matplotlib animation library and does a bunch of standard setup for being able to plot an animation, um, setting the mean and variance of the Gaussian PDF at the start and updating it as we go along in the uh, animation. Um, so here we are taking a look at the Gaussian probability distribution function, having its variance increase and initially it was a single spike at one position and slowly it is spreading out, decreasing in height and increasing in breadth. Um, the decrease in height is caused because as we increase the breadth, the total area under the curve must stay constant and be equal to one. Um, so this is what variance implies as variance uniformly increases, the height slowly decreases and the breadth increases. Um, next, we are going to take a look at a very similar animation, which is uh, which shows the mean of the PDF moving along. So here is the animation, and as you would expect, the animation goes from left to right. Um, this can also be done to other probability distribution functions, and you can just change the Gaussian PDF here and change the set of variables that you use um, passed to the probability distribution to visualize other PDFs, and we leave that as an exercise to the reader. The reason why Gaussian PDFs are particularly important is because they are the resultant probability distribution function when, a, when you take a sum of independent and identically distributed events. Say for example, you have a coin and you toss it a million times. The number of heads that are in the resultant sum of coin tosses would form some Gaussian probability distribution function. Um, say if you toss it a million times, the mean of this PDF would be somewhere around 500,000 because uh, the probability of heads is equal to the probability of tails. And then there will be some spread of this um, expected, spread around this expected value. Um, similarly, if you throw a dice uh, several times, the resultant uh, sum of the values occurring on the faces of the dice would also be a Gaussian PDF or the number of times say for example, two occurs would also be uh, of uh, sampled from a Gaussian PDF. This is because each of the random throws of the dice is an independent and identically distributed event, and the sum of such events would be a Gaussian, would form a Gaussian. Um, this is of real world importance because say for example, you are trying to count the number of people who appear at a sports event. Since every single person has his own independent choice of coming or not coming to the event and all of the people's choice are relatively identically distributed, the total number of people who turn up at the sports event would probably be a single Gaussian distribution. Next, we're going to try to use our plotting tools to visualize these Gaussian distributions in higher dimensions. So first we are going to visualize it in two dimensional space using Plotly's surface plots. And here we see this PDF visualized in two dimensional space where X and Y are the two input variables and the Gaussian distribution Z is written as a function of the Gaussian distribution along X and the Gaussian distribution along Y. The things to note is that whenever you have this sort of a um, PDF in which is a 2D Gaussian, then each of its dimensions are independently Gaussian as you can see over here. So the Gaussian that you see that is traced along in black is the marginal probability distribution, that is the probability distribution along uh, x, sorry, along y when you sum up across all of x, 
and similarly we can see the equivalent PDF along x when you sum along all of y. Uh, the product of these marginal probability distributions is the actual PDF that we see over here. Next we shall try to plot this out in 3D and since we do not have the luxury of having two input variables and the output variable being plotted on the third axis, uh, because in 3D we just have the place for three input variables, what we would have to do is we would have to plot them based on color and you can see over here the, and on the number of points sampled, the density of points. So you can see over here that as you go inside, the color becomes extremely yellow and the density of points is very high and as you come outside, it quickly falls off and rather exponentially falls off at one as one might expect. Again, it is possible to try to make uh, marginal visualizations, which is visualize this exclusively along x, y, and z, and each of those would follow independently a Gaussian distribution, and along x and y, if you try to marginalize this, then it will be a, a 2D Gaussian distribution. It is helpful to also try to visualize other PDFs in 1D, 2D, and 3D if possible. And again, that would be a nice exercise to do. Next, we would move to the heart of Bayesian machine learning, which is the Bayes theorem. The Bayes theorem states that the probability of some event A given some other event X equals the probability of some event X given the event A times the inherent probability of A divided by the inherent probability of X. To take an example, uh, the most common example we deal with is of say uh, diseases and symptoms. So the probability of some disease given some symptom, which is uh, typically hard to compute, equals the probability of that symptom given that disease times the probability of that symptom divided by the probability of that disease. So note in this example, if we have to tell the probability of some disease given a symptom, this is a very hard task that doctors typically do, but finding the people with those symptoms and finding out um, when this like what is the probability that this particular disease happens to them is extremely hard. However, the right hand side terms, which is the probability of um, the symptom given the disease of all the people who have the disease, how many have that particular symptom is an easy thing to compute. And how many people in the world have that symptom and how many people in the world have that disease are also things which are easy to compute. Therefore, this um, sort of formula uh, allows us to have a easier time reasoning about uh, symptoms and diseases um, using the Bayes theorem. Um, often in Bayesian machine learning, it is hard to compute this probability P of X. The reason is because even in this particular example, this would be the probability of a given disease, um, sorry, of a given uh, symptom and the probability of the symptom has to be computed by summing over the number of times that symptom has been has been seen for some given disease times the probability of some disease summed over all diseases and typically summing over all of these diseases is a difficult job because there can be a lot of different diseases in the world therefore we sometimes choose to use just the proportionality part and try to make our inferences without having this normalizing factor Later, we can try to normalize this, but normalizing the probability density functions is sometimes computationally difficult. And this would be a major challenge while we are dealing with um, Bayesian machine learning methods in the future labs. In any case, we start with taking an example of this. So uh, we are gonna hard code up some uh, numbers which are useful for our examples, and we are gonna phrase a problem. The problem says that you see a person who looks not particularly well built, we'll call him, uh, we'll say that he looks a little weak. And we know that this person is either a librarian or a farmer. The question is, which one is he? Now, if you did not know about Bayes theorem and the branch of probability that is not Bayesian is called frequentist. So if you are a frequentist, if you see that a person is weak and you know most of the farmers are strong and a lot more librarians are weaker even if more librarians are strong, say 40% of the librarians are weaker, while say 10% of the farmers are weaker. You'd, in, you'd very easily say that a person who looks weaker than usual is uh, 
librarian and not a farmer. However, this chooses to discount the fact that there are a lot more farmers than there are librarians. And this is what Bayes, Bayesian machine learning uh, or Bayesian methods in general um, take into effect. So here we compute the priors and the posteriors based on the Bayes update formula and you can go through these formulae and then we plot for the first thing the probability of being weak or strong given that you are a farmer versus given that you are a librarian. Now looking at these plots you would say that the probability of being weak as a farmer is very low and probability of being weak as a librarian is much higher and therefore this person must be a librarian. But once we try to take into account the fact that this probability of weak being a librarian must be multiplied by the probability of uh, just being a librarian and divided by the probability of being weak, then we would realize that this prior, which has, which says that there are a lot more farmers in the world than there are librarians, ends up biasing things. And the final probability that we get upon multiplying things together, or rather the like unscaled version of probabilities because we have not divided by the scaling factor. We have just used the proportionality version of the formula. We notice that the probability of being a farmer is much higher than the probability of being a librarian. The difference is less than the prior probabilities. The prior probabilities were a lot sharper. The librarian count was a lot less, but it's still more in the favor of farmer. And therefore, if you see such a person, just because you know that there are more farmers in the world, you should still most probably guess that this person is a farmer, even though it goes against human intuition based on the facts that have been presented to you for this question. This has been discussed in great detail in, uh, uh, in the, the same example has been discussed in greater detail in a three blue one brown video, which is linked at the end of this lab. So this sort of an estimate, which uses the posterior probability, the probability of librarian given uh, week, this fact is called the posterior probability. And uh, this is the probability of week given librarian is called the likelihood. Uh, the probability of him being a librarian beforehand is called the prior and the probability of him being weak is called uh, the evidence. So this sort of a estimate is called the maximum a posteriori estimate because we are trying to maximize over the uh, posterior distribution. Next, we shall see another example uh, of something called posterior pulling. So another way to view Bayes theorem is to say that we had an initial probability distribution over here. And by observing some fact, observing the fact that this person is not as well built as other far as you would expect of a farmer, you come up with this new probability distribution, which is up an updated form of the older probability distribution. If you are observing multiple things about the same person, then this, these probability distributions will get updated after each single observation. Please note that when you are observing multiple things about uh, the same person, and you are trying to use the Bayes theorem to compute each update, then all of these observations should be completely independent of each other. And you cannot use two correlated observations. Um, say for example, he does not have strong forearms and he does not have strong legs are observations which are correlated. And if you try to use these as two independent observations, you would come up with the wrong results. So here we are going to use an example where we have a coin and we are trying to figure out whether or not this coin is truly fair. That is, the, does this coin result in heads and tails and equal number of times with an equal probability or is it biased towards heads or is it biased towards tails? So um, to come up with this computation, we have run a few examples and for these examples, we sample from this thing called a beta PDF, which is a sort of continuous probability distribution between zero and one. So let us plot this beta PDF. It's taking a moment to plot. 
so yeah this is how um all right so what is essentially happening in this example is that we have um started by taking the example of a coin which is i presume inherently biased so as we start with the with a coin which is inherently biased that is the probability of its it being heads is uh, 0.7 and the probability of it being tails is 0.3 what we observe is that um, we can start off with a initial distribution which is very widespread um, which look like somewhat like this and it's somewhere centered around 0.5 it can accidentally be centered around 0.3 as we see in this animation after a few trials but eventually as we collect more and more examples and uh, use the previous iteration as the prior to compute the next iterations posterior and then again convert it back to the prior and use like the next computation as the posterior what we see is that this beta pdf which is the probability distribution between 0 and 1 of uh, what is the percentage chance of the coin resulting in a heads this keeps on getting updated and since we started with an uninformed prior or a relatively less informed prior after several observations we are still at a 60 percent probability whereas the ground truth is that there is a 70 percent probability of it being a heads as we'll get more and more uh, observations as we see here we started off with a bad guess and we are slowly converging to a better and better guess and as we get a lot more observations so we have I think a uh, hundred different observations in this example, as we get a lot more observations, we'll be able to converge to the true value of 0 0.7. So we can try this out with several different priors. And in these examples, we have shown how the different priors affect the posteriors. So first we start off with um, a fair coin and I'm sorry, I think the plot titles may be wrong i'll fix them but uh, we start off with a uh, sorry the plot title is uh, so yeah we have a fair coin with a biased prior so initially we believe that um, we would have more heads than tails and slowly we see that we keep on updating 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 and we converge to the fact that yes it is somewhere around 0 0.5 in the next example we always believed it was 0 0.5 we um, and the coin is, I believe, uh, also the, the coin is also fair, but even though we believe 0 0.5 in the beginning, um, the first time we see a heads and the first couple of times we see a head. So we see two tosses and sorry, we see two tosses and two tails and we bias our uh, probability more towards the tails and slowly we come back as we see more and more observations. Uh, we see 50 tosses, 25 heads, 25 tails. So we come back to the exact central uh, guess that we always had. When we had in the middle 15 tosses, four heads and 11 tails, then we were temporarily confused that, okay, we had started off with the prior, which was centered um, around 0 0.5, but we had shifted with a different belief. And uh, here we see how um, believing that you already are uniform converges to when the coin is actually biased. So if you believe that you are an unbiased coin and uh, you have to move to this biased distribution, it moves like this. And if you already believe that you are an unbiased coin, then this convergence happens a little faster. Um, so the priors actually help you. Um, if you already know, you would learn in fewer experiences than um, otherwise. And if you are ex like, if you are all extremely confident that most coins are actually centered around 0 0.5, then even with a few examples, you will not change your belief. So if you start with a different prior, which is extremely strong around 0 0.5 and extremely low everywhere else, then even if you see a bunch of heads, you would still have the belief that yes, this coin is fair. So the prior probability may not affect the final point of convergence after you have millions and millions of examples, uh, unless the prior of that example is indeed zero, but it definitely does affect the rate of convergence. Um, so yeah. Um, that is all the examples that we have in this lab. Um, we have shown a couple of examples of Bayes' rule and a couple of different interpretations. Um, we hope that this is useful and uh, helps you visualize Bayes' rule better. Uh, please feel free to play with these and uh, try to understand how you would apply these to uncorrelated data in real life and how this 
goes poorly if you try to uh, apply it to correlated data or you apply the same update based on the same data multiple times and generally get a feel of Bayesian, uh, the Bayes rule uh, as an update. Uh, also, uh, Three Blue One Runs channel and Veritasium's channel on YouTube are great resources for this. Um, thanks a lot for listening and uh, see you in the next lab. Bye-bye.